Um, we finished uh, the first session this morning with a couple of Slido questions. I asked you to go and talk to the social investors about what their three top tips were and how to get hold of their money. So I'm hoping some of you have done that. Um, and the other question was about the key barriers. Now, those of you that know me well know that I could probably waffle on at length, but I'm not going to because I found somebody in the audience who's got some lived experience. So, Carl, I'm going to give the, the mic to you. Awesome. Thank you. She said that she put on her lanyard, she wants people to ask her questions. They asked her question and now she's got me on the stage answering the question. <laughs> uh, um, good morning everyone, uh, my name is Carl Kanadu. Um, I run a social enterprise called Two to Three Degrees. Um, and at Two to Three Degrees we essentially serve the forgotten middle of young people. Um, we deliver personal development training in the areas of confidence building, public speaking um, and networking. And we serve that group of young people that might not necessarily be Oxbridge candidates at the top of the class making the school look really good. And equally might not necessarily be kicked out of school and known to the authorities because there's a lot of interventions for those two demographics of young people. But that forgotten middle that often gets overlooked, those are the young people that we serve and help them build their skills to become more employable and fulfill their potential. So, um, barriers. So we recently took on some investment and I think the key barrier for us was ourselves. Um, as a founder, the key thing that I realized was my view on money and financial literacy was the thing that really needed to shift in order to actually help see how um, social investment could help fuel our vision. So my thing is I grew up in a community where um, debt and money was bad in that sense. And so the idea of taking on a loan or taking on um, bringing someone into your home and giving them a piece of your pie was totally foreign to me. Only when we started studying and getting a better understanding of what it takes to be successful when running a social enterprise, were we able to ask ourselves the question, is this going to help us fuel our vision? And most importantly, is this actually going to help us serve more of that forgotten middle? And when we realized that was the case and we had the right people who could help us do that, it then became a lot easier. And I think that's probably the biggest transition that we need to make from a financial literacy perspective for a lot of social entrepreneurs. The issue is not necessarily the, the, um, the understanding of the different vehicles, because all of that stuff can be figured out. Even if you're someone who runs a social enterprise by yourself, you can get the advisors and the support and the understanding to find that information out. The key thing is actually, what is your vision and can this help you get there? And once you've kind of unlocked those two things and overcome that barrier, everything almost starts to fall into place. Um, so that was one key thing. But I think the other thing was also um, basically getting into bed with the right people. Um, having social investors that were not just investing in the social enterprise, but they were also investing in the founders of that social enterprise. It made us a lot more comfortable knowing that we were partnering up with people who cared about us and believed in our vision, not just from an ego perspective, even though that felt really good, from a perspective of they were like, as long as you are here and building the vision, we believe that you are the right people to be doing it. And that made it a lot easier because it means that we're now partners and you're not now a head teacher going to be asking for a monthly report about how your money's doing. And I think that was like the real shift in it. Hopefully that's helpful. Yeah. given away all my secrets now Carl that's the idea you ask me all the questions and I'll just find somebody else to answer them that's really good thank you so much for that Carl um one of the things that Carl was saying to me in the break um and it came from uh, Ashita's and Annie's session before is that it's about more than money and he was saying that the investor finding the right investor has sort of walked them through held their hand all the way through and I know that's something I hear from investors time and time again Perhaps sometimes the difference between taking on money, say, from a more traditional investor um, to a social investor. Um, and also that money was, we've, we've talked about some of these um, financial terms. So um, that money is revenue participation, so or crazy equity. Crazy equity? Crazy equity. So it looks like equity, um, but um, there aren't shares to give away. And it performs in a way where you share the risk with your um, investor. I can talk to anybody about that a little bit more later. But thanks um, so much, Carl, for, for sharing that. We're going to um, uh, move on to the next session. Um, and uh, sorry, there's two things that I wanted to, to say before we move on to the next session, which is, uh, again, Carl's stealing all my lines today. Uh, debt isn't bad, but bad debt is bad. And that shift and understanding um, is really important. And then the other thing that I usually say, don't tell my employer, and then I worry because we're live streaming. So they've heard me say this, it's fine. Which is that I don't actually care about social investment. 
I really don't. It's just a tool. I care about the impact that the social investment creates. And so I'm really passionate about trying to harness that money so that you can do more of the things that Carl was talking about. And it was really inspiring to hear you say that. So thank you very much. Right, enough from me. Back over to Anna for then our next session, which is around uh, building capacity, what support is available to help your organisation achieve its mission. And Anna's going to introduce you to the panel. Hello, everyone. You can hear me all right, I guess. Good. Um, Mel, sorry, we might need another microphone here for Lisa. Sorry. So, hello, my name is Anna Van Bilsen Irias. I'm a program manager at Access the Foundation for Social Investment, and I will be chairing today's session with this fabulous panel who will have the chance to introduce themselves in a minute. But before we do, I wanted to lay the ground of what we will be discussing today. So, capacity building or building capacity can take many shapes, forms, and names to be fair and tagged. So in essence, it is support provided to an organization that tends to build their organizational capacity and infrastructure with a view of long-term resilience. What the funder or foundation or whoever is behind that program can decide to do different things, whether that is post-investment support or funder plus, again, numerous tags on that support. But the key challenge, and this is what we will discuss today, that to my view remains uh, throughout, is how fragmented it is. Organizations on the ground tend to find it really hard to know what is out available out there, where to begin, and what is needed to get to a stage way before when you're social investment ready. So what is it actually that these funders, foundations and programs need from you? What are you gonna get from it? And what is the long-term view of this? To discuss some of these challenges, uh, and I will let the panelists introduce themselves, we have Lisa Raftery from Social Investment Business. Over to you. Hi everyone. Oops, still not working. Still still working. <laughs> hi, hi everyone. Yes, I'm, I'm Lisa Raftery. I'm Head of Grants at Social Investment Business. Um, I don't know if you've come across social investment business yet, but um, we're, an, we're a charity uh, that support char charities and social enterprises and companies uh, to, to increase their sh social impact. Uh, and we do that through providing grants and finance. Um, so, you know, we run a number of programmes that support organisations like yours who are looking to increase their impact. Um, and as Anna mentioned, uh, there are a number of challenges, one of which I think is key, a, a key area that she did mention, which is the sector is very fragmented. Like, where do you go for support? Where do you start? And I think for uh, many of the organisations that come to us for support, um, the programmes that we run actually really provide um, that start-up support. So one of the, one of the areas um, that I work very closely with Anna at the Access Foundation on is the Enterprise Development Programme. Um, and at the moment, we, we, that's a programme that supports charities and social enterprises who are traditionally grant-funded organisations who want to increase their um, income from trading and have an enterprise idea that they'd like to develop. Um, and there's some real challenges in even sort of getting to that point. Um, and as um, I think one of our, one of the, uh, I think we heard earlier, is around that financial kind of understanding, um, understanding your, your, your governance and some of the areas that you might need to look at in terms of your, um, your organisation so that you can come forward and apply for that funding. Um, we work with our sector partners on the Enterprise Development Programme and we've got one of our sector partners here, Swazik from the Centre for Youth Impact. And they really understand some of the sectors, uh, the sectors that we work with and some of the challenges they face. Um, I won't go into loads of detail right now, but we'll, we'll have a good conversation about that and I'll pass over to Anna. Thank you, Lisa. And we have here Samara Lawrence. I'll let you introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Samara Lawrence. Um, I'm a lawyer at the law firm Bates Wells. Um, you might have heard of it. We focus, or I tend to focus uh, specifically on charities and social enterprises. Um, I would say the probably the predominant amount of my clients are charities, but we also advise um, kicks, um, generally just not-for-profits, and more recently I've kind of developed quite an expertise in community benefit societies. 
Um, yeah, I advise a kind of whole range of not-for-profits, um, lots of NGOs, but also um, I have a real interest in focusing on supporting racial justice and social justice organisations. Um, so I've worked really closely with um, Black Lives Matter, with the Bay Bath Foundation, and other racial justice organisations, which has been amazing. Um, kind of advising a whole range of issues, so anything from setup, so choosing your legal structure, um, advising on compliance, regulation, um, contract support, fundraising. Um, I think I recognise that um, working at a law firm is actually really difficult to access legal support. It's, you know, we are, I work for Bates Wells, it's, it's expensive. Um, it's hard to know who to ask and what questions to ask and, you know, what support do you even need? Um, and I think I've been thinking a lot about how to address um, that imbalance in accessing legal support. So um, a colleague and I have, we've been thinking about setting up an organisation to try and take, I guess, law out of the law firm a little bit. Um, an organisation which we think can make uh, law, I guess, more affordable, the access to it, and really for organisations which are black and minority led. So I'm going to be working on that for the next nine months. So hopefully we'll have a bit more um, to say then. And last, but by no means least, uh, I would like to introduce you to Amani Simpson. And actually, we got a question. I think it would be a nice way to tee off your intro. So someone from the crowd has asked, how do people find funding and social investment opportunities in the sector? It is a minefield and trying to find information isn't easy. So I guess as a frontline social organization, will you be able to cover that a bit on in, in your intro, please? Yeah, for sure. Can you hear me okay? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, yeah, my name is Amani Simpson. I'm a social entrepreneur, uh, a filmmaker, and a youth coach. And I just love everything to do with empowering young people. Uh, I was a young person who I guess you would kind of categorize as hard to reach. I've been expelled from two schools, been arrested. I got stabbed seven times when I was 21. And I turned my life around through mentorship and just finding something that I was passionate about. And uh, yeah, my organization is called Aviard. Uh, we're set up to empower young people through personal development, similar to Carl. Uh, digital media and enrichment opportunities and yeah for me it's been a journey I was a property consultant after I got stabbed and started a business and just said that this isn't really I don't want to make money for rich people I want to enrich people that don't know that they can be rich and just not like financially but spiritually emotionally mentally etc and it's been a journey and um, you know where, where I am now essentially is in a place of uh, clarity I would say you know, I've spent time really listening. I was saying to someone earlier, I've gone into so many different rooms. I've sat with loads of people and I wasn't 100% sure of what I wanted to do or the impact that I wanted to have in the world. And um, I've just constantly listened and just kind of gone forward with this service mentality. It's how do I serve? Where, do, where am I needed? What do I have that I can bring to the room? And it's just continued to open doors for me. So, yeah, I'm grateful that I get to be in uh, certain rooms and I get to be myself every day and I get to kind of make it a little bit easier for those coming after me. So I'm grateful. And um, I guess to answer your question, um, in terms of funding, I, I would say for me, I've, I've had various different people at different stages of my journey that have advised me. And I think advisors and mentors are really, really important. Um, I've had um, like kind of uncle figures or big sisters or, you know, people that have done this thing before me that have sat down with me for an hour and just heard all my silly questions, things that just like, you should know that. But I, I, I didn't really do well in school and I, I left school with no GCSEs, but decided later on that I wanted to go back and study business management and got a qualification in that because I just was hitting the same barrier. And I think it's important to ask questions. So those people kind of pathwayed me towards um, different resources, which I know we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, uh, Organisations such as the social... Uh, School for Social Entrepreneurs, for example, done a program with them, recently did Hatch as well. Um, and yeah, I would say overall, it's been mainly my network, people that I've been introduced to, people that have given me time of day, that have kind of empowered me. And that's given me a confidence to be able to apply. And where I, where I haven't been, um, you know, kind of privileged to kind of understand everything, I've had people that have sat with me and helped me to do applications and stuff. So that's, I hope that answers the question. But nice think, to meet you. Cool. I think it does to a degree. And I think this is kind of further proof on how hard it is to line up the different support available at different stages of your organization's growth. And I think one thing we see a lot in, in our day-to-day -day work, uh, Lisa, is that where do I even start? Is social investment right for me? What do I even need before that? And I think it would be great if we can cover some of those challenges in terms of the skills that some organizations feel like they should have. 
Yeah, I think um, I think the best way to, for me to kind of talk about some of these things is to talk about the specific programmes we offer um, and run at Social Investment Business in partnership with with Access. Um, and I think one of the you know, it is quite hard to access investment. And I think organisations do have to, as Ishita um, mentioned earlier, there are, you know, documents that you're asked to prepare and there's things that you're asked to kind of, you know, the due diligence process is quite hefty. Um, but one of the programmes we run, uh, which is the REACH Fund, which really, it supports organisations to become investment ready. So they, it, it provides a grant for organisations to um, get those documents ready. So looking at your financial modelling, looking at your forecasting, uh, looking at your business planning um, and, and key areas like that that are needed for um, social investors to take your investment to their committees to, for approval. So um, I'd say, you know, we've, we've got some great examples and you can have a look on our website as well of, of sort of case studies of organisations who've gone through this process. Uh, one of which is North East Dance. Um, you know, they, they have a studio, um, you know, they had the opportunity to kind of look at how they could, uh, you know, gain investment in that studio to scale up what they were doing and, and use the REACH Fund to access social investment. Um, Boxing Futures, they had a great model uh, where they were supporting young people, um, you know, through boxing um, and, you know, start, started to kind of generate trading and income through that and were able to scale that up as well um, and open up in different areas using social investment through the REACH Fund. Um, and equally, there's um, Handcrafted, uh, which is a homeless charity, um, who um, actually provide accommodation for people experiencing homelessness. And again, we're able to access REACH fund um, support to then get social investment as well to, 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 to um, open up more properties. Um, and I think... Um, the, the other area to kind of mention as well is our own um, social investment fund as well, which is the Recovery Loan Fund. Um, and, and there is a, a, a flexible finance attached to that as well, which is a grant um, that supports organisations who are perhaps smaller, um, who, who need a bit of an additional support to access social investment. So do also consider the Recovery Loan Fund and the flexible finance. Um, and yeah, I think those are probably helpful suggestions. And we have a couple more questions, and actually, Samara, this one, I think it's for you. What tools will you recommend for a legal checklist for startup and growing social enterprises to re reduce cost and fear of engaging with legals? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, we've actually kind of just, um, together, the panel built together a repository of, I think, support and advice, I think. Um, there's, there are lots of organizations which do offer um, advice on legal structures, I think, is a good place to start. Um, and I think if you can go to um, a lawyer with, you know, a bit of an understanding of what you might need um, or kind of the options that can, you know, having some knowledge before you get there can help to reduce costs. I think, you know, having just one call with a lawyer can, you know, run into the hundreds and hundreds of pounds. Um, I think pro bono support, if you can get it, but that a lot of that is about accessing the right networks to find, the, to, to find pro bono support and find pro bono lawyers who understand, I guess, social investment and social purpose. And, and I think it's, it can be really challenging. I think that's basically what I've really identified recently is that there is, it's hard to get it. Um, I think, we, you know, if you can ask your investor as well for potentially you know, additional funding to, so you can get the right support as well. I've definitely seen clients where that's been built into their offering is, is you know, here's £5,000 so you can go to X lawyer to get support. I think that's a really good thing to ask for. And if you don't ask for it, you won't get it. Thank you. And I, I was wondering, Mel and, and the Good Finance team, whether we could actually run a quick poll with the, with the public on what are the actual biggest challenges that they face as organizations trying to access support. I wonder if that... Katie, can we get it running, the poll, please? It's interesting to see capacity as one of the top uh, challenges. Um, Lisa, I was wondering, um, this is quite a, a common element we see on the Enterprise Development Programme applicants, don't we? 
Yeah, yeah. So capacity is a huge barrier. Um, and actually, I think one of the areas we see it the most is when through the enterprise development program, which is where organisations are have been traditionally grant funded. They've been running from project to project. Um, they've got very limited staffing, maybe only one paid member of staff or none. Uh, actually, maybe volunteer led as well. Um, so really, how do you how do you overcome that particular barrier? And some I think some of the most ingenious ways I've seen um, organisations come uh, overcome that is by increasing the capacity of their board members. So really um, strengthening their governance as an organisation. So bringing people on your board who've got good experience, uh, got have trading and marketing experience that can support you in your develop, you know, in developing your enterprise, um, and and that's a way for really supporting the capacity of your organisation until you can start generating income, until you can start bringing that money in to support you to grow and actually bring on more paid staff. Thank you, Lisa. And I was wondering, Amani, can you can you walk us through your experience? Was this something you faced when you were setting up your organisation? Yeah, for sure. Um, I would say as a, as a solo entrepreneur, um, and especially someone that's sharing their story, you can't really get anyone else to share your story for you, right? So um, I've spent quite a few years in that space of being the only person going into rooms and, you know, going into schools and stuff. And then the pandemic, and the pandemic wasn't, you know, it wasn't uh, a good time for a lot of organisations. For me, I saw it as a space of growth and to be able to pivot. Um, amongst other things and um, yeah it, it definitely kind of empowered me to look at my business model and look at the future kind of future proof in this idea that I had and um, you know it's 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 been it's been a journey I'd put it that way um, being honest it's it's been one where at times you've kind of wanted to you know say mm, is it worth it you know I left the high flying business that I created and, you know, of course, the whole idea of having an impact is really important. But when you've got a mortgage to pay, you've got family, etc. It's a lot to weigh up and juggle. Um, but I would say that kind of the motivation, the driving factor of trying to create a better uh, landscape for young people, which is obviously my mission, um, kind of pushed me through. And, and, and luckily, I had um, really good advisors, as I keep going back to, that kind of just gave me that encouragement and just said, look, you know, just keep going. Like, you know, I remember one of my one of my. Uh, my mentor said to me at the time, look, you know, don't necessarily worry about the money right now. Worry more about service. And in doing that um, and having that mentality at a very critical point of my journey, it opened doors that, you know, I was able to get commissioned by the mayor of London to do a film. I did some consultancy with Anthony Joshua, like loads of different things that just came out of nothing. And that kind of tipped me over to the point where now, you know, coming out of the pandemic, I was able to really refine my business model and work out exactly how is this going to be sustainable going forward. Um, I didn't have that before. I was very much on a, as you said, project by project, project by project, because it was good. You, you know, you're getting phone calls, people are calling you, but then something like the pandemic comes and it gives you an uppercut, no pun intended to AJ. Um, it gives you an uppercut and, um, you know, it, it, it kind of just shows you that you have to think about how is this thing going to be sustainable? And um, I'm glad to say that that's where I am now. So, yeah. Thank you for that. And the other one is uh, the always present uh, access to funding. And unfortunately, I think no one on this panel has a, a magic recipe as to where we can go. But actually, someone from the, from the public has asked, um, I've lost the question now, uh, if there is any website, central website you go to uh, to find opportunities, resources for people, for you to signpost uh, applicants to. Any experience on that? Yeah, I mean, I think this is, comes back to your very beginning point, Anna, that about the sort of fragmented sector. It's very difficult to find information. However, there is a great website called Funder Finder, which is obviously a great place to start just to get a sense for where, where you get your information from. However, um, we are putting together a really great resources pack for you all with some really key links uh, to different organisations, different um, supports that you can find on your journey at whatever point you are on that journey. So whether it's that you're looking for initial kind of input as an organisation to develop your enterprise, come to us. Um, if you're looking for social investment, um, you know, to kind of access how you know to get support to access social investment 
again, you know, do come to us and have a chat to us. Uh, we've also got some of our um, social investors in the room that we work with. So we've, I think we've got Key Fund here, Big Issue Invest, Triodos are here today. So do speak to them as well, um, because we work closely with them on the, on the REACH Fund to access um, that kind of social investment. But um, it, is a, it is a tricky area, but do, you know, hopefully the pack that we're putting together will, 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 will provide some um, you know, information for you there. Thank you. There's also, just, of course, go uh, on. Just, just on the pack, um, as I was reading through the list, I was just like, wow, I needed this when I first started. Like, just the, the categories that it's been broken down to. And I know that it was initially your brainchild, so <laughs> give you a big up, you know. And um, yeah, I, I needed something like that because you kind of, um, when you're not sure, kind of necessarily the road ahead of you, you kind of end up like jumping through things. And sometimes it feels like it's time wasting. And I feel like at the stage of your journey now, you know, a pack like this will definitely save you a lot of time. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's great to have that tool. There's also the obvious uh, option. If you're looking for social investment, good finance is a well-rounded tool. Um, no one has paid me to say that. Uh, <laughs> Um, but it is honestly is a tool that's started with a strong foundation and it's built from that with an ever-changing sector. So that is a great point to start. There's also a question from the public that really draw, me, draw my attention is how important is advice and support from peer organizations, especially around sharing knowledge and skills? Lisa, this is something we see day in and day out on, on EDP. Can I be really awful and ask the audience because we've got Swazik here from the Centre for Youth Impact and I just think that actually her perspective on how that peer support works on the Enterprise Development Programme could really benefit. Sorry Swazik, I hope you don't mind. <laughs> you knew it was going to happen. You sat at the front. Hi everyone, my name is Swazik. I'm the EDP manager, so the manager for the Enterprise Development Programme and I work specifically with youth organisations who are developing businesses or social enterprises that involve and benefit young people. So as part of the EDP, those organizations will get grant, they will get consulting support, but they also get a lot of peer-to-peer -peer learning. And that's really important because first of all, when you're, imagine you're starting a bakery. If your base mate is starting a coffee shop, you're not working on the exact same project, but you're gonna face some of the same challenges you're gonna be really cognizant of the sector you're evolving in. And every time you are either facing a challenge or finding a solution, that's also really useful to them. And the thing that we hear all the time in the EDP is that it's really lonely at the top. It's really lonely when you're perhaps the business development manager in your organization and you're only one of the few person in your organization um, who is kind of social enterprise minded. And so the peer-to-peer -peer learning aspect of the program gives you that community aspect that's really, really important. And exactly as you were saying, um, especially when it gets really hard um, to kind of have people who can help you find solution, but also just tell you to keep going. So we found that's completely crucial aspect of the program. Uh, and if you want to talk more about it, I'm always available. Thank you so much, Rosie. Thank you. Um. I would just add as well, like prime example is just now, I, I know Carl, Carl's a friend of mine and came over just there and just opened up about his journey of getting social investment, like literally two minutes before we went on stage. And I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I was just like, I'm inspired, like to see someone that's a few steps ahead of you, to see someone that's just gone through that, that kind of lived experience is priceless. And there's many other people I've, I've met. I noticed Nana's at the back, I think, Nana, what's happening? Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Uh, and just, just various different people, Mentivity, loads of different organisations that I've connected with that they've sat down and just said, you know, have you thought about doing this? Or this is what this organisation are looking for. And that kind of uh, game plan blueprint is really, really important when, you, when you're kind of really carving out something that's brand new for you kind of thing. So. Thank you. Um, are there actually any questions from the present public we've we've been reading loads from the website so if anyone wants to ask a question i think mel is doing the rounds with the mic uh, so feel free to grab her um, we've actually had a couple more questions come through um, does the reach fund have themes for application no no themes um, it, it, it is literally open to all 
Charities, social enterprises, not-for-profit companies who have a social mission, obviously, you know, that they would fit into that category anyway, but who have a social mission. So there's no themes. EDP does have three, so Enterprise Development Programme does have themes at the moment. Um, so we do work sector by sector. Um, so do come and talk to me about that if you're interested, but REACH doesn't. And um, we've had another one. This one's for Samara. Um, trying to juggle too many things at the same time. Um, oh. oh my God, it's disappeared. So if I remember correctly, this is a social enterprise. Uh, so a community limited, an organization that is limited by shares and whether that will uh, basically mean that they can't raise social investment. Is that true or not? No, that's not, not true at all. Um, if, I mean, I, I think it's a really good point, thing to think about is your legal structure and actually that it, it can impact what kind of social investment you can get. So, for example, if you're a company limited by guarantee, you don't have any shares and therefore you can't get any equity financing. So, and the same for a charity. But yeah, company limited by shares and, you know, there's the kick structure, which is really good. I think lots of people in the room will probably have registered as a kick, which is a community interest company. Um, there's community benefit societies, which are also every member will hold a share. So, you know, um, I guess a greater range of um, investment options if you, you know, have shares in your, in your organization. But also thinking about the funder as well, that some funders will only fund specific types of organizations and specific legal structures. So I think getting the legal structure, and un I guess understanding your legal structure is, I think, really fundamental and especially at an early point. And so it, ca it can impact the kind of financing you get. Thank you. I think, um, oh, we've, we've got, got some questions. questions. We've yes, got, we've got three questions now. So can I go over here, Ali's first? Here. Yes. Hi, everybody. My name's Ali from um, an organization called Caribbeats. And my question is this. So I, oh, no, that's it now. <laughs> I started um, Caribbeats in the first week of lockdown and it wasn't a plan to start a business. It was um, a request from the community. And from that, we carried on for over two years and um, we're still going. So my question is this, um, I now need to be a, a, a viable business, which started as, like I said, a, re a, a request from the community. Are there any um, funds or any support to help me to do that? Because what's difficult is, as, as Amani said, it's all right, a bit of funding here, a bit of funding there, and it's just, it's not sustainable. That's just me saying, okay, yeah, great, we'll do that for 10 weeks, then we'll do that for, you know, um, yeah, it's just, it's difficult, and I'm not getting the violin out, but what I really need is um, funding to help me to have the time to be able to grow my business, because of what we're doing is, I'm blowing my own trumpet, it's a good thing. But, um, yeah, I need the time to build that. Shall we take the three questions in one go and then you want to allocate them afterwards? Sure. Uh, oh, hi. Uh, my name is Ruth. I run uh, Jowins Women to Women, a uh, domestic violence charity based in Oxford. Uh, but my experience, I've spent 22 years now in the charitable sector. Um, I think it's a good um, conference that we're here today about addressing imbalance and the title capacity building. Um, I think that um, I am personally tired of gathering all the time about talking uh, about capacity building, nice stories and all of that. We actually need action. Um, I know that uh, organizations that mail works in uh, may not necessarily uh, give funding to social enterprise like us because they go to the big boys and girls. Um, and I think one of the major in my 22, 23 years experience of being a community activist, I think one of the major issues for black ethnic minority organization, just like my sister said, is really capacity building. Uh, to make them investment ready and also uh, for their idea or mission or vision to be viable. Uh, and I think organizations like yourselves need to really come together to create funding if you really want to put your money where your mouth is to engage the BAME community for real in building their capacity for them to understand 
um, how viable their vision and mission is and not to be afraid to jump into the social in investment to take on loans so long as they know that it is viable. So put your money where your mouth is. Lovely, thank you, Ruth. Right, Patricia. Hi, I'm, I'm Patricia Hamzai and I'm with um, Social Enterprise UK. I don't really have a question, I just wanted to ask Samara perhaps to clarify a little bit. Um, companies limited with shares, yes, you know, there's no law against them in the social enterprise space. However, they are, it is problematic. A lot of funders, um, investors, won't give to companies limited by shares unless your articles are very clear about your social purpose. So I think you have to think very carefully about the structure that you're building for your enterprise because once sometimes once you're there and you've created it you can't go back it's really difficult so take your time to make that first step into deciding what's the right structure that can help you grow your enterprise that would be my advice i, I think you might agree yeah lovely thank you very much okay so you three questions okay well i'll, I'll take ali and moji's I completely agree, Majid. Put, put our money where our mouth is. Can I can just give a big shout out to the Abele Initiative? Who it's a shame that Phil is not here today because he was meant to be part of our panel. Um, he's unfortunately poorly, but actually we work in partnership with Ubele and Access on the Enterprise Development Programme. We have a um, we have a sector theme on the Black minoritised community. Um, and actually, we have a current round open at the moment. Um, and, sorry, no, opening shortly. I'll give you the details of that. Um, it is a really supportive programme. Um, it, as Swazik mentioned, not, just, um, not, not, not only do we provide support in terms of a grant, we also provide support in terms of a programme of training and peer support through to support you to develop that enterprise further to, and to, to kind of make it viable. Um, so do come and talk to us about that because that, that is, a, you know, is, is a fantastic programme, a supportive programme um, that you know, understands and works closely with the black military sector. So do come and talk to us. Um, Mel, I believe we're at time. Are we? No, you've got yeah. five minutes. Oh. Carry on. Can I, can I answer yes. that question as well? Um, just to, I guess, encourage you as well. Um, it's slightly different to, obviously, what you guys have offered, but I was on the Hatch Incubator, uh, incubator, incubator <laughs> tongue-tied, incubator a few months ago. And as much as I've done different consultancy or different conversations with advisors, like having a structured program that kind of spoke about your, uh, your value proposition, your business model, all of these different things gave me a confidence that is really important. And I think especially if you, if you haven't necessarily started out um, with that idea, you started out with a, with a mission, you know, having people that kind of help to refine it and get you to think about certain things and kind of open your eyes to things that maybe just, oh, I didn't think about that before and get you to do exercises, um, like a college course, for example, I think I did it over like 12 weeks. It's, um, if you can get onto something like that, I'm not sure if that's similar to what you offer, but yeah, I would advise. So I've been on Hatch, Unlimited, uh, SSE, and what Ruth was saying is, I'm done talking. <laughs> I mean, I want some action, and I want I want the support to 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 make these things happen. I I can sit and I love Hatch. Don't get me wrong, I'm a big fan of them, and I'm a big fan of all these business support, but. I don't know, maybe you believe be different and I'll, I'll try that. But um, yeah, um, action. Yeah, um, I would just, because uh, Create Equity, the company I run, is also supporting social investment business in um, providing the capacity building support to um, the flexible finance program. Um, what I would say, though, is that the, the screening process or the, what was called the due diligence process um, talked about in the, um, the initial session was said to be a good process. But actually what it tends to do, it tends to screen out black-led organizations. And so even that debate, and even it, it being framed as a good process, in, a, in itself exemplifies the problem, if that makes sense. Because we're calling it a good process, but actually what it does is it does filter out certain organisations. Now, we can provide the support to those who meet the eligibility criteria, but many people here won't meet that criteria, so we won't be able to provide them with the support. So there's something structurally that needs to be addressed in order to get this 
thing working. And hopefully that's one of the things that we'll be talking about later in my session with Patricia and others um, going forward. Thanks. Can I just um, say you. one thing really quickly? I think this, this conversation is coming up a lot around especially core funding for organisations, there not being enough of that. And I think if you look at um, organisations like the Baobab Foundation, they're going to be a huge grant funder coming up and they're there specifically to support black and minoritised ethnic community groups. And I think they're looking at sort of de-risking the application process and understanding that the onus shouldn't be on the organisation to prove themselves and prove a project or a concept, but to people to feel empowered and supported and for the money, you know, to be given where it needs to go. So I think definitely look at the Baobab Foundation and look at resourcing racial justice as well. I think they'll, they offer some good support. We've got one, one, oh, one final question from here and then we'll summarise. I was literally just about to mention the Baobab Collective Fund. Um, anyone who is running a black-led or global majority-led organisation, the Baobab Collective Fund is offering grants of between five to £30,000 um, every year over the next five years. And you don't have to be registered as a particular company. You could just be a collective that isn't registered. But it's all about black-led and global majority-led organisations that are working towards racial justice. Um, the Baobab, B-A-O-B-A-B -A -A fund, and you have to register your interest by the 23rd of September. Um, so I'd really recommend um, putting your name down for it. Thank you, Salma. Mel. Um, this is the Mel? last oh, question. It's actually not a question. Uh, just to flag that um, I'm here both as a trustee of Hatch Enterprise, so really good to see some um, of you having benefited from that. And I know it's been the CEO's long ambition to kind of create grant funding program for uh, the people they're supporting, and they've started to do that, which is great with a lot of corporate support. Uh, and I'm also a social investor. I work for Care Venturesome, and we've actually just launched a new program in partnership with Hatch to exactly offer that that social um, uh, that capacity building support as well as uh, blended finance uh, at the end of that uh, journey. Uh, it's a start, it's a pilot program. We're looking to support 10 to 12 BAME-led uh, women social entrepreneurs, uh, but we're hoping to, you know, do more and more of that. So hopefully, I mean, this is one example. I think Sib has mentioned the Baobab Foundation. There is a lot of change at the moment, and uh, hopefully you can take comfort from that. Thank you. M Mel, I'll just have a quick question here. Okay. I'm going to, by all means, I'm going to give a, a little bit of a, um, a warning to the room. We need to try and keep our questions quite short so we can try and get as many people um, in as possible. Go for it. Um, cool. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Mohamed Soya, and I run a creative marketplace platform for young people from underrepresented background. Now, my question is an issue I'm having consistently. So I've built a business. I've built... Um, a normal corporate, corporated business. But the issue I'm having is accessing funding. And what I've figured out is not that I've gone through the route of creating an actual sustainable business that can be easily monetized. However, um, until that monetization kicks in, the problem I'm having is between that gap of recruiting, which I'm already doing through university and stuff, but also now I have like 10 interns working with me, for example but they want to stay on board. Um, their internship is finished in a few weeks, and the issue I'm having, I can't keep them on because one, I just monetize. My company's not creating revenue enough to sustain those 10 individuals, and I can't access certain funding because I'm limited out of it as a limited company. Um, so it's an in-between gap I'm caught up in. So it's like, one, who here specialise in grant funding that can help me tap into that? That's my direct request. And secondly, what advice can you guys give for businesses caught up in those kind of predicament? Um, I think uh, we had another one or we taken on? Um, Lisa, I think you. Yeah, I, I, I think that is, that is a common hurdle. And I think that is, you know, as Ruth says, I think it is actually... Uh, there is a bit of a structural issue here in terms of, um, you know, how we move past that situation because, you know, how do you get past it in, unless you can get that grant support? I will say that the Enterprise Development Programme does support organisations like yourselves who are in that space. Um, and I'm sure that, um, as Sama um, and Samara have said, that the Baobab 
um, Foundation would also provide that kind of grant support. It is about supporting organisations at an earlier point in that. I know you've got a successful model and you're, it's the gap, the financial gap that you're talking about. But I think that's the part that is often a hurdle. But I think there are more of us now out there as funders who are addressing that, um, that gap. Um, and I, I agree that there should be more, more of us. Um, I think we are coming to an end. Uh, I know there's a number of questions on, on here that have come through electronically that we haven't answered, but we will endeavour to include some pointers into the resource that hopefully the Good Finance team can share with attendants afterwards. So hopefully that will provide a good starting point. But this, this is a place where everyone's gathered around to discuss these issues, challenges and common uh, problems. So reach out to any of us. We're here for a little bit longer, I believe, but also feel free to reach out to us via LinkedIn, email or any other platforms. We'll be happy to continue the conversation. So first of all, thank you to my panel. You've been amazing. So thank you very much for telling your stories and experiences. And thank you for the good finance team and Big Society Capital. That's it from us. <laughs>